Hello everybody, welcome to episode 54 of the Wildlife Photography Q&A and the first one for 2021. So, a happy new year to, to all of you. It's a funny thing that, you know, when do you actually start saying or stop saying happy new year? It's, um, we're almost at the end of January and still some of the people that I've seen for the first time this year, it's still, um, you know, you still keep on saying happy new year to each other. But because this is the first episode, happy new year to all of you and I hope you have a fantastic year and... Um, yeah, let's hope it's better than, uh, better than the last one. So, as always, your wildlife photography uh, questions, thank you so much for sending them through. Um, I'm going to be answering them in this particular episode. So, without wasting too much time, let's get straight into it. Question one, coming up. How do you know what to pick, what you capture? Alicia, th thank you so much for your question, and it, I think it's something that we deal a lot with um, our clients out in the field, you know, especially when you're shooting a, a sequence, how do you pick the shot that you're going to keep? And it's often you look for, for small things, for eyes open, you know, um, specifically with, with big cats. If you photograph lions, for example, when they're walking, you'll find a lot of the times they'll actually have their eyes closed, particularly if it's sort of late morning or early afternoon. So... Shots where the eyes are open and the ears are forward, sort of to have that expressive um, facial expressions. And then if an animal is moving, to try and look for that sort of where that leg is sort of curled around to show that movement. Um, small things like that will, will give you a stronger image. Um, so that's normally how we would, we would pick our, our best shot. An easy way to do this in Lightroom is if you hi highlight like maybe five or six or ten images out of the, out of the sequence and then to press N for next to each other. That's the easy way to, to filter through those, those images to be able to, to pick the right one. So I hope that helps. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email. I'm happy to assist you with that. Are there any restrictions or rules about wild animals? You're too close to them and can they attack? Okay, so the funny thing with that is there are no rules actually with when it comes to, to wildlife. So you can't say, for example, with lion it's 10 meters or with elephants it's 5 meters because every individual animal is different. I think that's why it's so important, you know, from a, as a guide, you know, from a very sort of early age to understand animal behavior. 95 like, percent of the time the animals will give you some sort of warning you know, whether it be um, elephants trumpeting or a lion growling or snarling at you, or the animals might just run away into a thicket. These are signs that will say that you are too close to the animals. Um, so it, it, it is a bit of a tough one. You know, there, there's no sort of set, set rule for, uh, for the animals. But I think as a general rule of thumb, rather keep a little bit more distance and let the animals approach you. I think that way you'll be 100% sure that the animals are comfortable with you being there. If they don't want you to be there, they'll either change direction or, you know, give you one of the signs that I mentioned before. So that'll be my advice to you is look out for those signs. If they do give those, those warning signs, then, you know, rather sort of let them be and move on and go photograph something else. How to click more expressive photographs. Okay, so I think... <laughs> The only way to really get more expressive photographs is to, to have more patience. I think that that's going to be the, the only thing. I think it's probably one of the elements in photography that is the most underrated. I think a lot of the, the people, you know, FOMO is a big thing in the bush. If, you've, if you don't know what FOMO is, the, the fear of missing out, people will be sitting with a particular sighting. So say, for example, like lions sleeping, and you're always wondering what else is out there to, to photograph. Rather stick with your subject, invest time in there, and the more time you spend with that animal, the better your chances of seeing them actually doing something. So, you know, other than that, I, I can't think of any other ways to express or to, to photograph more sort of um, expressive images. I think that comes with, with patience and with spending time with a particular animal. Opinion on Tamron 70 to 200 mm f 2.8 lens for a Nikon D7100. So, like, personally, I haven't actually used the, the Tamron version of the, the 70 to 200, but I have used um, Canon, Nikon, and also the, the Sony systems. And it is definitely one of my favorite lenses to, to have. So I've got no doubt that the, uh, the Tamron will be a fantastic buy for you. It's a, it's a very versatile lens. I mean, you know, if, you, if you're photographing places in South Africa, at 200 mils, 
usually is enough because you can go off-road. And for places like East Africa, it's a great lens to photograph animals in environment. So I would 100% um, have that in my camera bag. It's usually one of the first lenses that, that go in. Um, and uh, yeah, like I mentioned, a, f a fantastic lens. I think no matter you know, which brand you go with, the 70 to 200 2.8 is, is going to be a good buy for you. In your opinion, what is the most photogenic animal? Okay, yeah, so that is quite a tough one and, um, and very much sort of up for debate. I do think, though, that you know, leopard is always going to be something that, that people are, are drawn to. I think you know, no matter what a leopard is doing, people are always going to photograph it, even if it's sleeping. I think they're just um, amazing creatures. For me, personally, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, wild dogs. I think they're also very photogenic. And, and cheetah will always be up there as well. So I think those would be my three animals that I think are the, are the most photogenic. Also, you know, like we often forget some of the sort of more common animals, things like giraffe, uh, zebras, they're always good fun to photograph. I do find, however, you know, like the, the darker animals, sort of buffalo, uh, rhinos, and elephants to a degree as well, can often be very tricky to photograph, especially during harsh light. But I would, I would lean to, uh, to like some of the big cats, leopard, cheetah, and then maybe African wild dogs. Those would be my three. How large was the largest pride of lions you ever saw? Okay, so I was lucky enough, um, when was it, 2019, yeah, October 2019, to go to the Savuti Marsh. And we were fortunate enough to, to see the mega pride in the Savuti Marsh. I think they were 30 or 31 lions. Um, which is absolutely incredible to see. If you, if you haven't watched the documentary yet, it's actually a documentary about this particular pride called Africa's Giant Killers. An incredible, uh, very raw documentary, but uh, it's basically about this particular pride of lions that have specialized in, in taking down young elephants during the dry season. So um, that would be the biggest pride I've ever seen. I remember in Medikwe as well, there was... Um, a pride called the Mosella Sellers, which I think they were also 20 or 22 odd lions, which is which is very impressive. You know, it is incredible to see prides that size. But of course, you know, it also comes with their challenges within the pride. You know, just trying to sustain um, the whole pride and get enough food for all of them. So that's why you'll find often these prides would take down bigger prey. You know, buffalo, hippos, and like the Savuti Marsh case. Um, young elephants as well. So that'll be the biggest prize and yeah, true privilege, man. Opinion on converters worth losing aperture for? Nicholas, thank you for your question. And I think it's a, it's a very interesting one and very relevant one because it's something that a lot of people ask when out in the field as well. Um, I've used converters quite a bit, especially in East Africa. And, and I must say, especially the, the newer converters are amazing the the 1.4 and two times converters i think it also depends on which lens that you you put them on so in the past i've used them on uh, the 400 2.8 uh, lenses so then you're sitting with a uh, like a 5.5 uh, 560 mil um, lens at what's it f4 um or an 800 mil lens at f5.6 you know which is which is very doable I think the, the problem comes in, you know, if you start putting it on the zoom lenses with a high aperture. So if you put it like a 100 to 400, which is already at 5.6 at 400 mils, if you then put a two times converter on there, then you might, you might struggle, especially in the low light. But on your prime lenses, on your 300, 400, even 500 and 600 mil lenses, um, your primes, definitely worth, um, worth putting a converter on and works wonderfully well in East Africa. If I want to get a photo of a bird or a ship and I want the background not to be the main. Tammy, thank you so much for your question. Um, I hope I'm understanding the question right. I, I think from what you've asked, do you mean to have your, um, your subject like your bird or your ship in focus and then the background a little bit blurred because that will then be like a shallow depth of field. So, you know, if you go the lowest F number, you know, so ideally like a, a 2.8 or a F4 lens, but it also, there are some variables in it as well. So it depends, you know, how close you are to your subject and how far your background is from your subject. So say, for example, if you want to photograph me, 
you probably won't be able to blur this uh, this wall out behind me because it's so close to me. So I think you know, these are things to, to take into consideration. And um, if you're doing your photography on foot and you're walking around, position yourself in such a way that um, you either get closer to your subject because that will also um, just increase that sort of depth of field, that, that blurriness of the background. Um, and I think, you know, if you're photographing birds in particular, whether it be in your garden, look for that nice sort of dark background and try and choose a background that's a little bit further. I don't know if you have um, like feeding stations or things for your birds, but try and just position it a little bit further from the background because that will blur that background out a bit more and have your subject stand out. So I hope, uh, hope that helps. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch and I'm happy to, to help you further with that. Steps for wildlife photographing in ascending order. Um, okay, so that is a very interesting question. And I think if I, if I to just break it down, I mean, there can be a hundred steps if, if you want to go that route. But I think if you break it down in three steps, the first thing would be to understand your camera, to know your camera system. Um, the second one would be, what would I go for? To... Um, to know what you want to photograph, to know what you want to create, the, the kind of images that you want to create. And I think the third one, again, is, is to have the patience to, you know, to get those particular images that you're after. That would be the steps, I would say, to, you know, for, for your wildlife photography. I think it also depends, you know, the, the, again, like the images that you want to create will often determine which destinations you're going to be traveling to. So I think a combination of those things that will help you with your wildlife photography and um, take your images to the next level. Hey guys, thank you so much again for sending those questions through. That's uh, episode 54. Um, we will be doing this again next week. So every Friday, this will be going out on, uh, on YouTube and also on our Instagram. So feel free to send through any of your questions either to Jerry or myself. I'll leave our emails down at the bottom here and we'll look forward to hearing from you guys soon. But uh, until next time, thank you for watching. We'll catch you again next week. Cheers.